The carnivore diet has been growing rapidly in popularity over the past several years. And I really wanted to you know, figure out and uncover who the typical carnivore or carny, as we'll call them in this video, are and do they actually have anything in common with elite level athletes? So I have a, a paper here from the Harvard Research Group who collected a lot of behavioral and demographic information about individuals following the carnivore diet. So we're gonna be breaking that down in detail in this video. Now, part of the reason why I'm interested in learning more about who the typical carnivore or carny is because I recently did a video on why I feel that the carnivore diet is one of the worst diets for athletes and is something that as a licensed sports dietitian would never recommend for any athletes that I work with. So because of this video, I got a lot of backlash in the comments from these carnies who are, you know, very passionate about their diet. So I wanted to learn more about this typical individual. So I started by just looking through the comments and looking through the profile pictures of those people and seeing kind of what they're all about. And I started to make some observations um, that were pretty consistent throughout the commenters, but I didn't want to jump to any conclusions uh, or make any assumptions. And I just so happened to come across this paper here from the Harvard Research Group that was done back in 2023 who surveyed over 2,000 carnies and got some information about you know, their demographics, their anthropometrics, um, behavior, lifestyle, and things like that. And what I saw was pretty eye-opening in the results here. It was funny because it actually debunked a lot of the things that these commenters were saying on my last video and ultimately led me to the conclusion that there is a major, major difference between vegans and carnivores and I'll share that with you all at the end of the video. So of course, if you're here watching this video, you probably have some understanding of what the carnivore diet is, but if you don't, it is essentially the opposite of being vegan. It's a diet where you restrict all plant foods and only eat animal foods for the most part is meat. Sometimes dairy is allowed, depends on who you talk to. But of course, a diet of just meat might be pretty bland. So in this research study, they asked the individuals what their frequency of intake was for additional food items. And some of these just made me literally laugh out loud. So I'll throw this up on the screen. That way you all can follow along as I'm going through it. So we'll start with herbs and spices. So, you know, to me, I don't know of any animal-based herbs or spices. Most of those come from plant foods. So you would think, well, someone who's following a carnivore diet certainly wouldn't be eating those, right? Well, that is not the case because only 21% of the carnies so that they never use herbs and spices. So that means 79% of these individuals actually did use herbs and spices. Hmm. That is interesting. And then we have a couple of, you know, plant-based drinks, right? We have coffee and tea. So 76% of the individuals who follow the carnivore diet actually drink coffee with 49% consuming coffee daily. Well, that doesn't sound very carnivore to me, does it? And then tea, obviously that is going to be, you know, mostly herbs. Uh, about 49% of the carnies consume tea. Carnies are not very big beer drinkers, it looks like. You know, 86%, 83% said that they don't really drink beer or low-carb beer or seltzers. But if we go down here to alcohol, spirits, and wine, 45% of the carnies drink some kind of hard alcohol. And then 43% are consuming wine. Again, both of those are plant-based drinks because I don't know of any alcohol of any kind that comes from meat. So just a little bit contradictory if you ask me. And then the last one of note, we have candy and milk chocolate. Again, chocolate, it comes from a cocoa bean. So that's going to be a plant food as well. 19% you know, of the carnies consume some kind of candy or milk chocolate. Uh, and then the dark chocolate you know, 48% uh, consumed dark chocolate. So it would seem, you know, from this, you know, from the results here that majority of the carnies do include some kind of plant food or drink in their diet and it is not 100% uh, meat-based. It also makes you wonder if any of the reported perceived health benefits that they're experiencing from following the carnivore diet might have anything to do with some of those plant-based ingredients or drinks that they're consuming. Like we know that herbs and spices from lots of different research have many health benefits, um, as does dark chocolate. 
So just an interesting note. Uh, the research study also looked at daily eating occasions and found that the majority, it's 64% of the carnies ate two times per day. So again, when I relate this to elite level athletes, most athletes are training for hours and hours a day and require a lot of calories, a lot of fuel to support that type of training. And they're certainly eating more than two times per day. Only 16% and then 1% of the individuals ate three times or four more times respectively. So that would be more in alignment with what an elite athlete and how they might fuel, you know, probably four to five times, sometimes more than that for some cases um, in terms of fueling frequencies per day. So not at all like an elite athlete, you know, eating two times a day means they're probably skipping breakfast, eat lunch and dinner. Now down at the bottom of this page here was something pretty eye-opening because a lot of the comments I was receiving in that prior video was talking about how people who are not used to the carnivore diet just aren't used to being in ketosis or that, you know, the, the ketosis is what could potentially be beneficial for athletes and that I'm an idiot and yada, yada. So if we look down here, right? It says ketone measurement method. Um, the most glaring thing that I saw was that, you know, 60% of the individuals did not check their ketones. So that means 60% of the carnies aren't actually checking their ketone levels to see if they're in ketosis at all. So how do you know if you're in ketosis if you aren't actually checking? Especially if you're a first time carny, you probably don't know what ketosis feels like. So how can you know for sure that you're in ketosis and that's why you're receiving a benefit? Keto diets are traditionally very high fat and very like moderate to low protein, whereas a carnivore diet is gonna be very high protein and you know because of gluconeogenesis can actually convert a lot of that protein into blood sugar which would kick you out of ketosis at all anyway let's see what the tested level of urine ketones was we have negative trace small moderate large so the majority of individuals who are carnies who reported that they actually tested ketones saw either a moderate to trace amount of ketones in their urine so because these individuals really aren't testing their ketone levels and we see from the urine ketones that, you know, the majority of individuals are seeing a small to moderate level in their urine, which most people probably see that at some point over the course of the day. You know, we can't really conclude as many of the people in the comments were saying that, you know, the ketones are really the reason that you know, the carnivore diet is so effective or could be effective for athletic performance. So now we get to the really good stuff, which is talking about the anthropometrics and laboratory studies from the people who reported blood work. So we can see in the middle column that the average carny here, 52 years of age. I don't know about you, but I don't know too many elite level athletes that are 52 years old. And then we have two different columns where they explored the pre-diet, um, anthropometrics and blood work and then compare that to the current status of these individuals. So the average pre-diet body weight was 95 kilograms or 209 pounds and had a BMI of 30.8, which is classified as obese. So again, these are not LeBron James, Usain Bolt, uh, Lionel Messi type individuals. Most of these individuals were at least on one medication with the third quartile actually being on an average of four medications. Total cholesterol for the pre-diet, um, ideally we want total cholesterol to be under 200. The average for this group was 214, so they have elevated cholesterol levels. The LDL or low density lipoproteins, ideally we would want those to be under 100. And for this group, they had LDL average of 135, which is quite high. HDL cholesterol, which most people would know to be the quote unquote good cholesterol in the body. Um, the average here was 56. Ideally, we would want those to, that number to be above 60. Triglycerides, that is a measure of another fat in the blood. Typically triglycerides are gonna be elevated when carbohydrate intake is very high. So in the pre-diet uh, group, the average was 109. Ideally, we want that to be under 150. So we're looking like we're in good shape there. Hemoglobin A1C is gonna be a marker, a long-term marker of the amount of blood sugar 
in the in the blood in the body in the blood 5.7 was the average and that is a pre-diabetic level crp or c-reactive protein is a uh, measurement of inflammation in the body we want that score to be under one and here we see the average for the pre-diet group was one so not ideal there from an inflammation standpoint the rest of the markers creatinine we're looking at alt ast ggt those are uh, measurements of uh, kidney and liver health and function most of those check out there so pretty good and then we get to the final blood marker which is the cac or coronary artery calcium which is a measurement of the or the assessment of risk for coronary artery disease as it measures the amount of plaque buildup in the blood vessels that typically ranges from a score of zero to 400 plus and we want that number to be as close to zero as possible so we can see in the the first quartile q1 you know, pretty low there. The average score was zero. Um, but in quartile three in that group of individuals, the score was 182, which is not ideal, which brings the average for the entire pre-diet group to 26. So now we have a pretty good understanding of what the blood work was pre-diet before they started the carnivore diet. And then we'll take a look at, you know, what the blood work showed after they followed the carnivore diet and this was a minimum of six months. So as we can see with body weight, we saw a reduction in all the groups uh, from the average Q1, Q3, a reduction there. You know, the average was uh, 209 pounds pre-diet. Post-diet was 182 pounds, so a 27-pound reduction. So we saw weight loss. Again, carnivore is a very restrictive diet, so you're eliminating a lot of foods that you're typically eating. That's going to result in a calorie deficit. So we would expect to see weight loss here um, as far as that being optimal for athletes, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. We definitely don't want an athlete to lose weight. So potentially, this could be a diet where it is difficult to maintain weight or even gain weight if you're an athlete. Now, here's where it gets really interesting because when we start looking at the measurements of heart and cardiovascular health, you know, the total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, the CAC, this is what was pretty glaring to me. So to start total cholesterol, again, when the average was 214 for the pre-diet group in the post-diet was 253. So we saw a significant um, difference or increase in total cholesterol from the pre-diet. Uh, and then if we look at the LDL, so that is the, me the measurement of, you know, the quote unquote bad cholesterol. Again, the pre-diet average was 135. And we have an increase, a significant increase up to 169. So right there, we have two biomarkers for, you know, cardiovascular health. You know, say what you want about those biomarkers, but we have an increase in them from individuals following the carnivore diet. So for all of you saying that, you know, carnivore diet is healthy and there's no risk for heart issues or cardiovascular issues, I mean, based on this data, you can't assume that and there's no other long-term data looking at the carnivore diet on heart health and cardiovascular health so i'm not really sure where people are coming up with this information and these claims that it is so heart healthy now we did see an increase in hdl so that is obviously a positive thing because we want hdl to be high 56 in the pre-diet group and then 66 in the post-diet group so we we're above 60 which is ideal triglycerides lowered as well the pre-diet group average was 109 the uh, diet group or current group was 74. So we saw a reduction there, which again, we would expect because triglycerides again are gonna be impacted by consumption of high carbohydrate foods or excessively consuming carbohydrates. So if you're pretty much eliminating carbohydrates from your diet, you would expect triglycerides to decrease and that has happened. Now, in terms of the hemoglobin A1C or that blood sugar biomarker, we didn't really see much of a decrease, right? The the pre-diet group was 5.7 and the post-diet group was 5.5, which is curious because you think that you would expect to see the H1C decrease now that we've pretty much completely eliminated carbohydrates from the body. But ultimately, it's not too, too surprising because as I mentioned before, when you're excessively consuming protein, some of that protein will be converted to glucose through gluconeogenesis. So that could potentially have caused or been you know the reason why there was not as much of a reduction in the hemoglobin a1c six months is definitely enough time for hemoglobin a1c levels to drop as it is a, a three-month snapshot of your blood sugar levels 
So, you know, that's twofold. We should see some impact on that if the carnivore diet was actually beneficial for blood sugar levels. We did see a slight reduction in inflammation. So the average went from a 1 to a 0 0.6. So not a significant reduction. So again, for all the individuals saying that carnivore cured my inflammation and I'm no longer inflamed, do you actually know that you actually get your blood work tested? Because, you know, based on this you know, small sample size didn't really have much of an impact on overall inflammation in the body. The kidney and liver functions pretty much remained the same. So next we see the CAC levels, and that's really where we get to the scary part of all this, because while the quartile three group did lose weight, we see that their coronary artery calcium levels actually increased pretty significantly. We see that they started at 182, and then after six months of following the carnivore diet, um, increase that coronary artery calcium or plaque levels up to 243. So again, not ideal changes in these groups where we see total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, coronary artery calcium all increase despite the fact that they've lost some weight. And you know this is all while being on the carnivore diet for just six months. So we can only imagine what would happen if they were following this diet for decades. Now, there will be individual anecdotes of people that say they've been following the carnivore diet for 20 plus years and their blood work has been perfect. Um, I guess the closest analogy I have to that person would be a cigarette smoker, a chronic cigarette smoker who hasn't developed you know, lung cancer or emphysema or any other type of disease as a result of chronically smoking cigarettes for 20 plus years. You know, they just got lucky. And ultimately, that person's, that one person's anecdote isn't enough to say that cigarette smoking is healthy or that, that it should be recommended for other people to do the same thing. So because of this survey, we can make some conclusions about the typical carny. We can make the observation that most of the carnies are male as over two thirds of the respondees to the survey were male and less than a third were female. We can also make the assumption that most of these individuals are overweight and unhealthy based on some of the blood work data that we saw. And because of that, are probably looking for a way to improve their health, you know, get healthier, lose weight, whatever the case may be. We can also make the observation that most of these individuals are on the older side. So, you know, 40 plus years of age, as that is what the majority of these respondees were and that they are overweight and unhealthy based on the blood work that we reviewed. So we might assume that this person has a lot of chronic health issues. Um, they might be trying to lose weight. They might be trying to get healthy and you know, rid themselves of you know, pain or illness, disease, whatever the case may be, and you know, probably have tried some other type of fad diet before. So my overall conclusion is that the typical carny is not an elite level athlete. And that's because elite level athletes are typically not this overweight, are not this inactive, do not have the host of you know, medical issues that some of the typical carnies have. Um, so probably wouldn't be looking to follow or subscribe to like this type of really restrictive fad diet. In fact, I would say the typical carny probably has more in common with someone who chooses to use Ozempic for weight loss than they do with elite level athletes. And that brings me to my final conclusion, which is the biggest difference between vegans and carnies is that at least vegans are 100% committed to their vegan lifestyle and do not consume any animal foods, don't even use any animal foods, not honey, not shampoos, not products with any type of, you know, animal-based ingredient or additive. Whereas as we saw in the, the survey here, the carnies actually consume a lot of plant-based foods, lots of coffee, tea, alcohol. So they are definitely not as committed of individuals as vegans. In fact, one can make the argument that carnies are frauds.